My guest today is Kira Soderstrom. Kira, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. It's almost the end of the day here in Chicago, and I'm excited to get my evening started. Um, you have a really interesting background. Tell me about it. Yeah, it was definitely nonlinear. Um, I have a background in mathematics and economics, mm -hmm. and I started entering Kaggle competitions back in 2000. And 11, 2012. Wait, what kind of competitions? Data science competitions. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I actually was um, placed in the top 3% for seizure prediction and things of that nature. And I um, entered into consulting in data privacy and data security. Um, and then from there, I, I went full-time into machine learning, custom solution architecture at Microsoft, and then became a general software engineer. And recently... About a year ago, joined the Power Platform, a Power Platform Reliant team. All right. So you're an engineer working for Microsoft and building solutions using Power Platform. Yes, uh, that's what I'm Platform doing now. Power isn't, Platform isn't really just one thing. It's a, it's a suite of products, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it has. We have a ton of different products. I think that Power Platform stack, um, it's known for being a low-code, rapid business application platform. And it houses Power BI, Power Apps, model-driven Canvas apps and portal apps, Power Automate, um, Power Virtual Agents, Microsoft Dataverse, and Data Connectors, and also AI Builder. So um, it has it has a bunch going on, and it is a suite of tools. That's a lot. Um, you mentioned low code. What, what do you mean when you say low code? Yes. So when we take, um, when, when you think of high code, you think of infrastructure as a service, you need to configure all the privacy, you need to configure all the security. When you get into the low code space, you're into like uh, SaaS development projects a little bit more, SaaS um, but you is... um, software as a service. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And so you think about, you know, how can we capitalize on the speed and agility of uh of low code, so building rapidly without as much code, um, while including complementary high code components as necessary. So instead of thinking like, I need to build everything from scratch, I need to build access controls, set up my database, have all these technical people on the project, you can outsource a bunch of that with Power Platform and really focus on what matters for your specific scenario at hand. And we also have the opportunity to bring in what we call citizen developers. So on our teams, we have pro developers, and those are people who know, um, you know can code in any language, know standard development practices, you know the, the front end, the back end, you name it, they got it. And then you have the citizen developers, and those are, are our subject matter experts. So the idea of these citizen developers, they're, they're not necessarily programmers, maybe they're, uh, uh, the, I don't know, accountants or they're researchers or they're uh, uh, project managers for uh, some construction <laughs> company. They know, they know the business problem, but they don't know code. And they yeah, can, precisely. They can use these rapid application development tools to build their solutions. Yes, and in, in some scenarios, you don't need pro developers. So we want to be able to empower people to get as quickly to production um, in enterprise scale applications. And there's also other tools that you can use to, um, you know, any logic that you want to repeat that you don't want to um, do manually. There's a lot of tools within this stack for, um, for people to be able to be empowered so they can focus more on what matters most to them and less on the maintenance and, so and kind of tedious tedious activities. Yeah, I call it the plumbing, the stuff that I uh, just tested. It's got to be there, but it's uh, it's already it's a problem that's already been solved. Um, mm -hmm. Are these things like, um, oh, I don't know, saving a record to a database or retrieving a record from a database, those are, or a login, those are things that every application has to have, or almost everyone does. And so I've written them a thousand times. Uh, and that's, that's what? There's just a widget I can drag onto the screen or what? Yeah, so so for that, that would be Power Automate Flows, and these okay. are citizen developer friendly as well. Um, and so you can figure out where you're getting information from. We had um, 
we had a flow in a project that we recently published that was signed to, uh, um, that had a connector to Adobe Sign where we would pull data um, with, with the flow depending on a status and we could update records in our dataverse, um, which is mostly supported by SQL and a few other solutions as well. Um, but we have all the benefits of that. And so we could, we could support all, any logic that you want, want to happen. So updates to fields and databases, retrieving information, sending emails, um, alerts, monitoring, um, any, anything that, that you could think of. And we have out of the box connectors as well. So if you need integrations into SharePoint, if you need to move data from one location into SharePoint, that can also be done. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. well, tell me a little about the, uh, the security and the privacy issues. How was that handled in Power Platform? So that is one of the biggest um, selling points, I think, personally, because I think that um, privacy is a moving target, security is a moving target, and this is pretty much handled for you in Power Platform. You just need to make some configurations to figure out you know, how do you want to set up your access controls. And so it really helps you go to market faster because if this isn't something that you're thinking about when you're building an application, it's not the forefront of your mind, it's not in your requirements gathering, your development, and you're thinking about it towards the end, uh, that could be a, a huge blocker. Um, and hours and hours and days and days and maybe thousands of hours of dev time. Interesting. Um, is, uh, I, I've worked with Rapid Atticus Delft development tools before, and I've worked with people that use, you know, these citizen developers that use Excel to run their business, or they use an access application to run their business. Um, and one of the things that happens is they, they, after a while, they run into a wall, something that the platform cannot do. How extensible are these tools that uh, you can, can you add to them and add new features? And if so, how? Um, in terms of features, are you are you asking for specific functionality? Well, let's say there's not a, a connector or not a widget that does what, what you want it to do. I want to add some extra functionality to my application. How do I do that? What's what's the what's the process for doing that? Oh yeah, easily. So um, it, I think if you, so, if you if you take a few steps back, if you look at Power Platform, mm -hmm. all the components that I laid out earlier help you help you build apps rapidly. Right. Um, and oftentimes you'll you'll be leveraging pre-existing data. You might need to bring it in from different locations, and um, other times you might need to build a custom connector. So we have we have hundreds of out of the box connectors. So if you need to go to SharePoint, Adobe Side, and so on and so forth. But if you have um, if you need to grab you know data from a custom API, you can set up right. your custom connector. So that is pretty easy to do as well. And so there is a standard path, even if you need to build out, you know, do custom development components. So there is a lot of um, out of the box, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in terms of styling, formatting, app development, mobile app development. But then there's also an opportunity to customize with custom JavaScript. Um, you can even do some custom styling with HTML and CSS if you would like. And so you can, you can take all the goodness of Power Platform um, and what it brings to the table. But then if you find that you want something to be different, you can go in and build that out. And I think it just depends. You need to think about who are your users? Are they internal? Are they connecting with Azure AD? Do you also need to extend portal access to someone who has external auth, maybe with Oracle? Like that is all possible. So you might need to do a little bit more customization if something that you're trying to achieve isn't out of the box, but there are a ton of repeatable patterns. They have, um, pre-existing patterns for Power Automate Flow that you can also leverage. So if someone else really wanted to do this specific type of pattern, you're like, well, you know, this is applicable for my industry. Um, and so I imagine someone else might might have done it too. I would just recommend look it up and see see what else is out there because I think it is, it is very likely that someone's done that. And then if not, um, you can build a pattern yourself and share that, or you can figure out what the requirements are for your specific use case. But I, I would venture to say a lot of what people, um, like most common scenarios, are, are very easy to achieve out of the box. 
Got it. So the first step one is to see if there is something in the box that does exactly what you want to do, because there is so much. But if it's something that it's uh, the box has never heard of before, they have Dave's API that I just wrote yesterday and just invented it. If there's probably not a connector for that, um, then uh, you might want to read it, write that yourself using JavaScript. Uh, and in between, maybe there's not a connector that exists in the box, but maybe some third party has built one and it's either for sale or open source. Is that is that the idea, kind of the process? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I would say I just got off a, a project and we, we built a custom connector because we needed to grab data from their middleware team. So basically a source system. And so that obviously wouldn't wouldn't be out of the box. But still, there are standard a, a standard a standard process and flow to get it up and running um, and guidance also to support. Yeah, so it's not necessarily uh, to get their uh, source control system, but other people have accessed other source control system and that pattern is the same. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the issues, whenever I have working with any graphical tools for doing development, um, deployment is always a challenge, especially repeatable deployment, getting it into my DevOps pipeline. Can you talk a little bit about how that process works? Sure. Um, So one thing I would like to mention, and I found this out recently, uh, but it doesn't surprise me, but we do we do automatic backups with Dataverse. Um, But when you think about standard DevOps, you think about CI CD, you think about, um, I guess, maybe for high code solutions, you would create a feature branch, you would push to staging and um, PR that into main. Um, And I think there's there's a few variations, but that's like maybe that's, the most that's standard That's typically one. what I do, yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's a little bit different for Power Platform. You have a Power Platform CLI. You're going to be in the um, the maker experience. There's makepowerapps.com. And you log in there to access your Dataverse solutions, your Power, um, your power Automate flows, your connectors, and so on and so forth. You package that all up in a solution. So you can pull that down. Um, with a Power Platform CLI. And there's also, um, you know, once once you pull that down, you can push it up into source control. And so when it's up in source control, you can have your validation pipeline, you can have your um, CI pipeline and your, and your CD pipeline. So standard build and release practices, and you can, you can version it, you can keep it, you know, I, I know there's other ways to restore it, um, built by the solution, but if you want to, if you're a coder, you're used to high code engagements um, and projects. You can you can look at the iterations from one version to the next and how it's packaged up into the solution. And the solution itself is actually going to be a series of XML and YAML files. Um, and so it's not as intuitive, I would say, as high code because high code is a little bit easier to read for developers than this, but you can still see the differences in iterations from your last your last um, push to this one as well. Because it's text um, Exactly, they're, they're really all just configuration. Um, and so it is pretty easy to, to adapt a standard validation pipeline. You can check the solution, validate that it works. Um, there's some other checks that are out of the box as well that you can, you can call as, um, as your DevOps tasks or even through CLI, if you wanted to do some checks and you you didn't have Azure DevOps, that's fine too. And then your CD pipelines for QA and prod, um, pretty standard. Is there any um, way to set up automated testing? Are there are there frameworks for that, for Power Apps? I am actually so glad you asked. Hey, you're welcome. So um, I did a spike around this uh-huh. about a eight months ago, nine months ago. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Selenium. Yeah. Selenium is very standard. Generally industry, used for uh, user interface testing. Yes, and we do have Selenium built in to certain components of our our, um, our product. However, on the project that I was on, we didn't have it built in for portals. Um, and so for portals, I wanted to understand how to do end-to-end testing. And I found out that there's a a new competitor to Selenium on the market named Microsoft Playwright, and I Ours. I've read so many reviews, and it's it's 
you know, it's it's interesting because I worked on Selenium and then I talked to someone about it and they're like, oh, we just all migrated over to Playwright and these this is what you can do with it. Um, it's great. You can do videos out of the box, screenshots out of the box. Um, you have a code generator. So you can use CodeGen to write up um, your code. You can just like click through the browser mm -hmm. and based on these entities, it will, it will write up the code for you. Cool. And so, um, I think um, I think they're both great products. Honestly, um, there are a lot of a lot of uh, reviews that are non Microsoft that are, are leaning towards favoring this, and I was very surprised that I could kind of plug them in and out of my testing pipelines. So. Um, it makes it really easy to build test, and that's an easy way to test functionality within your app as well. So you can have a, um, a dummy user log in, test all this functionality, maybe some buttons trigger some flows, and some flows grab data from your source system, um, or maybe even dummy data there. And then maybe you want to validate that a status was updated in a column in a specific row, and then you can, you can check that, and if anywhere fails along the way, it will it would stop it and you would have a failure. Um, and so having the screenshots built into the system is is awesome. That is very cool. Um, have you ever run into a, a, a challenge where Power Platform just wasn't appropriate? Is there a, a, a certain types of uh, applications that you would say, you know what, high code is better here? I think I think that's very, that's a great question. I'm thinking a little bit more about the possibilities of incorporating components of Power Platform, mm -hmm. um, more so than I'm thinking about what it, what I shouldn't use it for. So I think when I think about overall architecture, um, I think about, you know, what is our need? What are our pain points? Is there anything that we can, we can leverage to make, you know, to make our journey to production quicker? But you know, for example, if you wanted to do a, you know, a machine learning um, scenario and you wanted an MLOps pipeline, Azure Machine Learning Service is, you know, is not going to be replaced right. by the Power Platform space. But you could leverage Dataverse in an MLOps flow. Got it. Um, and so, so I think there's a lot of potential of bringing it into architectures in hybrid scenarios. Um, you know, I think I, you know, there, there's definitely things that you might want to have infrastructure as a service for. Um, I would have to be presented with a specific scenario at hand and think about the opportunities and, and, and weigh the pros and cons to both. But I think I think people should be thinking about Power Platform as, okay, how can I get my data subject experts in the room contributing to the data model, contributing to like, you know, building out in this user-friendly experience and also have a seat for our pro developers at the table. And so say you have um, more complex components of your solution that need to be IS for some, some reason in particular. You can have the subject matter experts working with the data, data schema, and handing it off um, with web API calls into a different system securely. Very cool, I like that answer. That. Uh... There, the 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 some pieces of it, maybe like machine learning is a great example, can't be done, cannot be done in uh, Power Platform, but it still can be called from Power Platform. It can still be inter in, incorporated into a hybrid solution. Um, before we go, uh, some, there's a lot of people here that haven't worked with Power Platform at all. Where's a good place to get started and start learning about this stuff? Thank you for asking. Uh, so You're you can welcome. go to learn. <laughs> learn.microsoft.com and there's um, there's Power Platform Labs, there's resources, there's an interactive training called um, Power Up as well. And I think, um, you know, I, I was kind of talking a little bit about Fusion Ops, which is kind of the hybrid of pro developers, um, system developers, low code space, and how do you integrate it in your enterprise solutions. And I think um, my team actually might have some, some documentation that's release for, for the public consumption later on in the year. So I'll have to tap you on the shoulder when that's ready. Oh, maybe we could do another show when that's ready. All right, Kira, thank you so much for your time. This has been really educational for me. Thank you. I've, I have had a lot of fun.
my life, um, my goal in life is to improve happiness through data and the work that I do with that data. And so I would love to use technology to empower others to make meaningful change in the world. And I also would love to make some friends along the way.